Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, final full panel of the day at the Real Solutions Summit. This uh, discussion is about the case for optimism in the age of artificial intelligence. I promise you we're not going to get deep into the technicalities of AI, but AI is a nice way of setting up the discussion about what we think as a culture, as a society, as a country about the future, about progress, about technological innovation, and what are the threats to those things, and if we still believe in them or not. Um, I am very pleased today to be joined by uh, three experts on these issues who are going to discuss their views on uh, whether or not we can be optimistic about the future, whether or not uh, we should be fearing uh, what's happening right now in the United States and in the world surrounding these issues. Uh, first, it's my pleasure to, to, to welcome Virginia Postrel uh, to, back to Washington. Virginia is uh, an author and a columnist. Her, her most recent book was uh, The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. And I, there were a lot of copies earlier, and they've all gotten picked over. We bought <laughs> boxes of them. And uh, so if you want any copies of these books signed, just let the authors know. Virginia is also the author of a book called The Future and Its Enemies, The Growing Conflict Over Creativity, Enterprise, and Progress. Um, a book that really, and I'm not kidding, it changed my life. I, I quickly, after reading it, became the, the head of the Virginia Postrel Fanboy Association of America. I think I've named this the most inspiring book on innovation and technology policy uh, I've ever read. When I brought her to the Heritage Foundation in 1999, she signed the book to me, uh, Adam, to a great friend of the future, and I forever ripped off that inscription and used it in all of my books uh, after that. Uh, it's an amazing book. Um, so thank you for being here today, Virginia. Uh, we also have uh, uh, James Pethacus is here today, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and the author of a new book that is hot off the presses. It's just uh, less than two weeks old now, right? Yes, very hot. It's a yeah. piping hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Conservative Futurists, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. Uh, James writes frequently about these issues in his excellent newsletter, and he uh, has a book that I highly encourage you to all pick up. In fact, copies back there to pick up. Uh, welcome, uh, James, to the discussion. And Haley Craig is with us here today, someone uh, who is uh, very well known to the R Street family. She's uh, an R Street alum, and H Haley's on the front lines of the battles about <laughs> progress in the future. Now in the Senate Commerce Committee is the director of tech uh, for the Senate Commerce Committee under the ranking member Ted Cruz, and she is someone we interact with regularly at R Street to try to figure out uh, what's, uh, what's the, what's the look like on Capitol Hill in terms of these issues, not just AI, but all things technology and innovation policy. Haley, welcome here today. So let me begin by asking a question, which is, um, is, is the United States still uh, a dynamist, upwing uh, society, uh, country? Um, uh, we should define our terms. And uh, in Virginia's book, she, she says, uh, she uses the term stasis and dynamis um, are divided not just by simple short-term policy issues, but by fundamental disagreements about the way the world works. The clash over the nature of progress and over its desirability, does it require a plan to reach a specified goal, or is it an unbounded process of exploration and discovery? And then in James's new book, um, he talks about upwing versus downwing. And he says, uh, downwing is about accepting limits and even yearning for them. Uh, downwingers are doomsters. Upwing is about accelerating past limits, uh, much as rockets accelerate through the Earth's gravity well. Upwingers are boomsters. Um, and they, they use this, these, these paradigms to compare and contrast these visions of the future and how to think about technological innovation, economic growth, progress, and prosperity. So with, with that framing in mind, let me begin by asking uh, Virginia um, to reiterate the question, uh, are we still a dynamous country in the United States? Well, first of all, I think you have to differentiate between what I'm talking about in the future and its enemies, this idea of dynamism versus the, the broader term that Jim is talking about, this upwing idea. Um, in the future and its enemies, I actually have sort of three categories and two of them are on one side. And one of those uh, is, is te technocrats. These are the people who are upwing in the sense that they're raw future, but they have a very specific idea of what it should look like. 
and, and the Dynamis vision is much more decentralized, much more bottom up, much more uh, open to surprise and much more reliant on competitive processes, whether those are market competition or uh, you know, criticism, just verbal here in the, the museum. Um, and my view is that dynamists are always a minority, um, that they have to, that, that at least in, since, uh, probably always, but at least since the you know, late 19th century, technocrats have been dominant. And the question is, who do they ally with? Do they ally with the third category, which I call reactionaries, which are people who envision an ideal past and want the downwing people, the people who want to stop things, or do they ally with dynamis? And, and I think that's a way of thinking about our society. We, you know, we have elements of both. And, and again, this is a continuum. Most people have elements of many of these things in their personality. These are you know, sort of ideal categories. Right. So, 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 Jim, in your book, your first few chapters, you go through this history of sort of these booms and busts of upwing, downwing, and like these changing attitudes. Um, but where we stand, circa 2023, right now, are, are, are we upwing? <laughs> are we downwing? Where do we? Wh how do we consider our country and our culture? Well, I think we're going to run a like a real time experiment to answer that question. If the result of uh, uh, of this. What I, what I hope and I believe to be a pretty significant technological advance, meaning AI, generative AI, large language models. If, if we look back uh, two years, five years, by 2030, and it looks like that we've treated this technology much as we did in the internet in the 1990s, in which we decided this was gonna be a light touch regulatory approach then I think that is, that is fairly strong evidence that we have a significant upwing, still upwing aspect to our national character. Uh, if you have to go uh, to, the, you know, to the federal AI agency and get a permit before you let your model out in the wild, I think as some would like, uh, like to happen, then that would, that would say something different. That would say that perhaps the, the last embers of that kind of risk-taking entrepreneurial aspect of our character has been suffocated. And certainly it's my concern uh, about, the, about the latter, that the latter will end up being dominant. I hope it won't. I think it won't. But the mere fact that, you know, what, you know, 15 minutes after, uh, you know, chat GPT was in the wild, that we were all concocting Terminator scenarios, <laughs> where I'm not sure with, is, are they are they gonna are they gonna take our jobs then kill us or just kill us? <laughs> I, I may have lost the narrative a little bit on that, and I think I think again, I think we, I, we are sure I think you know upwing and dynamist in the best sense of those terms compared to some other places compared to Europe, but I hope that's not our comparison. Right. Our comparison should be like what got us here and what we could be and what our what our country could be. Uh, so that 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 is a comparison uh, I would make. So yeah. um, if you're you know if you're excited by AI, then I think you're you're in the uh, I think you're in the dynamist camp. I think you're in the upwing camp. And uh, right now, if you know, I'll, I'll I'll take whatever help I can from the technocrats. <laughs> though I don't though I don't much trust them in the long run. Right. So so Haley, this is a good setup for you because um, uh, Jim was uh, joking about like a federal AI commission, but that's been that's proposed already. That's on the agenda. Uh, there was a Senate Commerce Committee hearing back in um, February or March, I guess, where uh, uh, Open Altman, uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI was brought in to testify, and there were proposals put on the table for new agencies, new broad-based licensing. Uh, one uh, senator who shall remain nameless, who is a Republican, unfortunately, said that we should begin with the presumption that all AI wants to kill us. Literally just said that at the committee. Uh, I was pretty astonished by that. But, you know, what are we to make of this? I mean, are there, are there any dynamists left in, in Congress, or is it all downwingers now? There seems to be a lot of tech bashing happening on both sides of the aisle and a lot of questions being raised about, like, well, if we had to do the internet all over again, we hear the phrase like, yeah. we don't want to make the same mistakes we've made with the internet. Well, exactly what does that mean? You know, the internet was sort of born free. Should we have kept it in captivity? You know, what do you think about that we, attitude? We hear that, that um, phrase about um, making a mistake with the early regulation of the internet coming from 
the FTC a lot, specifically Chairwoman Khan, and I think some of her staff have also echoed that. And every time I hear it, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, we have the data. We know exactly what happened. Like, we have over 20 years of data showing what happens if you compare the US and the EU in terms of taking a permiss permissionless innovation approach or a precautionary principle approach, and we know exactly what happened. The EU doesn't have any success, well, they have a few, but they don't have as many successful internet companies as the United States has, not even close. SAP, I think, is the top one. Yep. And if you look at all these new regulations coming out of the EU that are really designed to target American tech companies, they all have like market cap thresholds and user thresholds in them. And it just is, it's all American companies that are being captured, and intentionally so. And it's because we have the most successful internet companies. Um, you said, um, you mentioned kind of Terminator scenarios and this kind of fear around AI. I just wanted to correct, like, AI doesn't, not you, but the congressman, I suppose. Um, AI doesn't want to do anything, right? It's a tool, and I've actually had to have a conversation with my team to say, we can't personify AI when we talk about it. It's, it's a technological tool developed by humans and deployed by humans. We can choose how to use it. It's not, we're not even close to a scenario where we have AGI that's gonna take over the world and, and kill humans. I probably, and I may be dating myself, but I probably benefit from not having seen Terminator or 2001, so. <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, um, I'm glad you, you set that up because that, yeah. that discussion about the, when I go into congressional offices these days, I'm confronted with people who I'm trying to, I'm trying to debunk myths based on pop culture narratives about technology and innovation in the future. And I, I can't tell you how many times where I'm arguing with somebody and they get frustrated and like, but did you see the latest episode of Black Mirror? You know, and I'm, I'm like, gee, I gotta debunk Black Mirror episodes now as part of my Hill visits, it's a regular thing. But let me, let me get back to Virginia and James with the, that question because there's a relationship between politics and culture. It's a very powerful one. Uh, last year I authored a piece that both of you were kind enough to respond to in which I was, uh, I was lamenting how hard it is to name positive depictions uh, of technology and innovation in pop culture. And I said, you know, when you look around at the world, we seem to always go back to things like the Jetsons or Star Trek as sort of like positive things, but everything else is just dripping with dystopian dread. Um, and James, you wrote a nice follow-up piece about that. A lot of that made it into your book. But Virginia, you pushed back a little bit on that. Yeah. You said, you know, not even Star Trek. I, and, I, you know. I live in LA, you know? And in LA, we know that there's something called the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You may have heard of it. <laughs> uh, and there's something, one of their biggest hits is a, a couple of films called Black Panther and Wakanda Forever, you know. And they're all about, I mean, they're about a lot of things, but they're highly technology, innovation, you know, Afrofuturism, all of that, and the whole Tony Stark thing is also pro. So these things exist in popular culture. The problem is, why don't I mean? And those are just you know some examples. But um, why don't why aren't those the touchstone? And how do we think about popular culture as it relates to this? And the and and my message there is, popular culture is also a dynamic process. Popular culture is, I, I feel like a lot of people, and not really talking about the two of you, but I've, I've been around a lot of libertarians, center-right people who believe in markets, who talk about culture the way hard leftists talk about the economy. They're gonna find a lever, they're gonna pull that lever, and they're gonna get the outcome they want. Mm -hmm. And that's not how culture works. Popular culture, the things that succeed, respond to what resonates with people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and I would argue that this is really what's going on in Black Mirror or in Terminator, which is a fabulous movie, uh, is people like to be scared. I mean, they like to be freaked out. They like to have these little sort of puzzles. I mean, it's just like the Twilight Zone back in the same day of the Jetsons. And, you know, a lot of those were kind of scary, creepy, even technological uh, episodes. There are a lot of things at any given time. And the question is, what stays in your memory? And the f far more, I think the, the, the thing that I think we should think hard about is the plastic scene in The Graduate, 
for those of you who have never seen The Graduate, and I, you know, I was too young for when it came out originally, but I did see it about 10 years after it came out, and it didn't resonate with me, but, you know, there's, Dustin Hoffman plays this young guy just out of college, hasn't really found his way. Uh, he, his parents, who are very affluent, have a party, and this guy tells him, you know, you should go into plastics. Well, I have one word for you, plastics. And, and, it, and you're supposed to see that that's the horror mm -hmm. of, of the, you know, the bourgeois, treadmill, meaningless corporate existence. And the question is, why in the late 60s was that popular? Or like, why did people react that way? And I think that's the difference between that generation and the generation that preceded it. Yeah. You know, but, but when you talk about the framing effects, how things stick in people's minds, I think that there's sort of a relentless negativity that I see in a lot of the pop culture depictions or narratives about the role of technology in society. There's, there's good ones out there. But I, I mean, Jim, let's, let's bring you back into this because you write about this a lot in the book and in your column. Um, I mean, uh, are there any signs that you have for optimism about the, the pop culture narratives? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if we should be as optimistic as Virginia suggests. All right, listen, I, I think it would be helpful if we were in a period of uh, not just where there's these interesting technologies, but where they were also obviously and indisputably making our lives better, accelerating growth, accelerating wages. I mean, you know, you know, chicken or the egg culture or, or, or economic growth and tech progress, it would be very, it'd be much, I think we'd be getting more sort of, I think, progress supporting culture if, if in the real world we were getting those kinds of advances. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I hope that AI proves to be a powerful general purpose technology that even bad regulation can't stop. And I think you would, be, I think you would see more sort of culture supporting policy that creates images of the future. So when people think about, I mean, with, any, with, with change comes disruption, but people have to think the disruption's worth it. If they think the disruption is only gonna lead to a future where all the rich people are living on a space station and everybody else is on, you know, uh, you know, just you know, fighting it out among rubble, well, then maybe, maybe disruption isn't worth it. But, you know, in my book, I, there's a quote from Michael Crichton who says, ah, you, know, you, can't, you know, you can't write about the future and be positive. There's no story there, sure. right? It needs, right? It needs to be negative. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to talk about Interstellar, which I think is a great upwing pro-progress movie. I'm talking about a different one, which you may not have seen. It's called The Peripheral. It's based on a book by uh, William Gibson. And in that, and in that story... It, you know, bad things happen in the 21st century. You know, nothing big, but a lot of small bad things from limited nuclear war, pandemic here, a bit of climate change there. And it all adds up so that by the year 2100, 80% of the world's population has died. So that is certainly a dy kind of dystopian uh, fiction we're used to seeing. But in, in the middle of that, and this is both in the book and the, um, and the TV series, well, I think it was on Apple Plus, so, you know, as Gibson writes in the book, science started popping. It started to all work. AI started to work. Nanotechnology, it all started to work. And it was enough to prevent the complete collapse of humanity, but wasn't enough to save us. And when I watched that, and this is a little bit how maybe, you know, my, my thought process, I'm like, this, this could very easily be a pro-progress story because it, it warns about delay about waiting, all the little barriers we've put up which still have delayed AI, which have delayed, you know, clean energy. And then when we finally figured it out, it was kind of too late, you know? We're sitting here having debates about climate change when we already should have, you know, coast-to-coast -coast nuclear fusion reactors, but we don't have it, so now, we're, so now we're still having this debate. You know, wouldn't it have been great to have all these vaccines ready to go uh, immediately, even though, we've, even though we were able to develop them very quickly? Uh, I would have much preferred to have, you know, AI as people in the 50s and 60s thought we would already have it. We, instead of, instead of you know, having a median income in this country of 75,000, maybe it'd be 150,000. So a lot of times when I see these stories, which seem negative, I think these are really stories about technological delay. Mm -hmm. and I, and I, but I don't think it would be that hard for Hollywood to create more positive stories. But hopefully if they won't do it, we have enough AI tools now with images and video we can create our own. Yeah, I think Crichton is wrong in the sense that that's like saying you can only write 
thing negative about the past. I mean, it, human beings are human beings. And if you write character-centered dramas, you know, where it's about their conflicts as people, and I thought you were going to talk about The Expanse, which is a good <laughs> example of the future that, you know, politics hasn't gone away, war hasn't gone away, people's interpersonal conflicts haven't gone away, but there are all these technologies, and it's, you know, kind of cool. Can I read something? Just sure. short, short. Sure. Okay, so this was just today, <laughs> and this was written by Stephen Heller, who, um, unless you're a graphic designer, you probably don't know who he is, but he's a very prominent graphic designer um, who also writes a lot. And he says, AI is going through its Wild West stage, and well, now's the time to be fearless, knowledgeable, and use AI for designers' creative needs, letting the software work for us rather than us for it. Let's fight for the right to be in charge. And he says, I suggest the following be read aloud in Jimmy Stewart's voice in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance for Best Tonal Effect. I'm not sure that's right. Maybe Jane. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I saw that re movie recently. Some, some folks are afraid that before too long, a stampede of AI-produced images will ravage and pillage our field? Are we ready to surrender? Will designers like the Buffalo be decimated by marauding bands of media moguls who want to replace design thinking with the aggregation of tried and true formulas that reduce creativity to a series of algorithms? No, no. Artificial intelligence can be a force for good or bad, depending on how it is used. It offers visionaries an opportunity to open new frontiers, to explore territories that have been only imagined. It should not be allowed to lay claim to any expanse where designers freely roam. When Photoshop was introduced, some smart yet short-sighted folks mourned the loss of brain and handwork that had defined the field for 100 plus years, but quickly the software was trained, tamed, and put to use as the designer's most valuable tool. The same concerns about AI are being bandied about. Not that there are not red flags, threats to galore about the dangers of stolen IP, false truth, and invented reality, but false has been true for ages. <laughs> AI has dangers built into it, but we must be prepared for them and certainly it cannot come a trespassing onto our range, causing a ruckus or ravage and ruin. AI needs domesticating, now's the time to do it in pronto. And when he says domesticating, he's not talking about anything that happens on Capitol Hill. He's talking about designers in the marketplace channeling the tool and doing the things that they, and I think you know this is something that people, at least people of a certain age, they've seen enough technological change in their life that they can be positive. Yeah, well, we, one of the themes we heard earlier today, um, or maybe it was Brian Hooks that just mentioned it, you know, we have these sort of cascading waves of technological change coming at us faster and faster. And it used to be in the past that a lot of that change, you know, it, it, it crested and fell a little bit slower, but now the sort of power of combinatorial innovation and just endless cycles of change. Maybe it's that speed of rapidity. And uh, James, in your book, you talk about uh, Alvin Toffler's famous book, Future Shock, from the early 70s, where he suggested that eventually we'd get to the point where this would overwhelm society. And that we would, it, it, Toffler predicted that people would just sort of like panic and melt down. I mean, are, are, are we there? I mean, because you're starting to see more and more sort of techno panics. And the only thing on the Hill that I notice that sort of drives out one techno panic is that there's a rise of another one. <laughs> there's like a new panic in town. And it used to be it took maybe a good 10 to 15 years for a techno panic to have a gestation period and like come to fruition. Do, then it was yeah, kind of, yeah, do you see well, the techno panics? So, yeah, but uh, last year it was crypto, you know? Like, yeah, there's one, right. And so, and Mark Andreessen talks about it in his lengthy blog post from a few months ago, he, he talks about the concept of Baptists and bootleggers, basically different groups of um, folks that kind of aim to profit off of fostering the panic and some legitimately buy into it. Those are the Baptists and then the bootleggers are the ones trying to kind of extract a rent from, from the techno panic, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what we're seeing on Capitol Hill is a master class in regulatory capture. I think that's what's actually happening. Um, there are always uncertainties with new technologies. Um, there, AI isn't even new, I just want to preface that, yeah. but because ChatGPT exploded so quickly and it was very accessible and visible to people, I think people started to pick up on, oh, oh, this is AI, right? Even though it's so much broader than just generating text. Can, um, can, can it's been embedded in Google Translate for years, right? That's why it's gotten so good. It got 
amazing overnight because of AI. Can I ask you to elaborate on that, you know, master class in regulatory capture? Yeah. That's something I'm sure a lot of people be interested in learning more about. I mean, because it's astonishing to me that of these early hearings we've had, a lot of the biggest, you know, new innovators in the AI space coming in begging for regulation. Yeah. And, you know, there were people talking about it. I remember I think the Washington Post said that the, the AI hearings in Senate Commerce were a love fest <laughs> between <laughs> well, the Well, so that was judiciary. Oh, that we was judiciary. We haven't had that a one, yeah. Um, yeah. full committee hearing on AI, actually, this right, Congress. Right, right, with Blumenthal. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, but what, what do you make of that? I mean, this is, this is weird, right? I think it's classic rent-seeking. It's a tale as old as time. And yeah. look, I mean, I'm not begrudging businesses for wanting to protect their market share. That's kind of the natural thing you would do if you were at the top of the pack, right? But um, if we kind of buy into um, this idea that this needs to be regulated immediately, which is what all the biggest market participants are pushing, we're going to be cutting out all the little guys that are doing some of the, the really, really key innovation in very specific sectors. And when we had our AI hearing at the subcommittee level more recently, we actually did try and get an AI startup to testify and could not find one that was willing to go on the record mm. up against the big guys. And not like, we're not trying to tear anyone down, like all the innovation is great, but we need to get the, we need to get voices from across the, the spectrum in the room so that it's not just, um, you know, the the top players in the, the industry. And you, you see this not just with the hearings, but also with the, what the White House is doing with their voluntary, mm -hmm. involuntary, really, commitments <laughs> right, on right. AI regulation. There's literally a line in them that's like, and we will make these mandatory later. <laughs> right, right. right. Um, that's terrifying. And then we're seeing it happen globally, too, with, with the UK and the EU. It's kind of just becoming this, this blob of, like, regulators and big companies working together to to push whatever it is, if it's permitting before you can deploy a model, right, if it's right. algorithmic impact assessments, there are also oh, a lot of workforce related concerns, all of that, is, those, are, those are burdens that small companies just cannot meet. Yeah, and, and, and Haley's actually, uh, she's under, she's actually like underplaying how bad the situation is. We just had I'm a- trying to be uh, tactful. <laughs> we released a piece yesterday, an R Street piece, about a sort of legislative fall outlook, like what was happening on the Hill, and you know, multiple bills with full-blown licensing schemes, yeah. uh, multiple bills with new agencies or bureaus of some sort, massive expanded liability requirements, the algorithmic impact assessments or explainability and transparency schemes. Um, this is a really interesting moment from a sort of technological governance perspective that I want to ask you all about because as Virginia talked about, the sort of the technocrats who both want to promote and restrict at the same time in different ways. You know, the only thing that's passed Congress in recent, recent memory was the CHIPS Act, which was a massive multi-billion dollar promotional uh, effort, but almost everything else usually fails. But some of these efforts are focused on sort of micromanaging this new technology in a way that we didn't for the internet and software. And I would also add for consumer electronics. I use the phrase in my work and in my book on permissional salvation that a lot of technologies that we've, we have today that have been most successful are lucky enough to be born free as opposed to born into regulatory captivity. Um, and yet AI seems to be headed to be put right into captivity and, and, and boxed in and, and under maybe multiple regulatory paradigms. And the preferred one I'm seeing on the Hill, uh, Haley, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there are people talking about combining financial regulation, telecommunications regulation, yeah. a dose of traditional like FDA rules thrown in, and then a whole heck of a lot of liability on top of it. Yeah, I think the way that um, there, there's that one bill in judiciary that creates a new agency to oversee like all technology basically, and what they did was model it off of the CFP, CFPB, but put it inside DOJ, I think. So it would be in their jurisdiction as a committee, but um, that is, it, it's, it's scary, but also it's, I think it's actually really unnecessary if you're, what, what I try to do is like take a step back and I'm like, okay, if you think this technology is so terrifying that we need to regulate it, please tell me exactly what risk you're solving for. Right. Like what is ChatGPT gonna do? What is an automated system that improves scheduling or, or whatever it is, precision agriculture technology? What, what is this gonna, how is this gonna go off a ra the rails in a way that we need a brand new regulatory agency to go prosecute um, any issues that we have or sue companies for right. deploying an algorithm in a way you don't like. And I, I have not been able to get an answer to that. <laughs> Other than from the left, there's some fear with like misinformation, which I don't buy into because you can create misinformation on your own. You don't need AI to do it. 
Um, but it was nice uh, part of your quote that you read there. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. and, and one point that I've seen made on that, the misinformation, is a lot of the stuff that's been like circulating since the Hamas attack right. has not been, it's not been AI generated, it's just been mislabeled. This is a real picture of something really happening, right. but it was in a completely different place. And, and AI a, can and proactively like five years detect old that. And, yeah. Right? So like AI can actually be used in a, in a positive way here. Yeah. Say, actually, no, like we already ran a search on the internet. This picture is five years old. Yeah. So Virginia James, let me ask you to comment on what Haley and I have been talking about here, because it, we're, we're painting kind of a bleak picture, picture of where we're heading in terms of sort of the new regulatory paradigm for artificial intelligence and a lot of emerging technology, computational technologies. So looking back, Virginia, you, when you wrote your book, there was a hot debate going on about GMOs that has continued in some ways and, you know, biotechnology and other things. I remember Bill Joy wrote his famous piece, oh, The God, Future yes. Doesn't Need Us, right, yeah, in 1999. Right, right. Um, and, uh, you know, so maybe we can comment on like that. But also, James, I know you've talked a lot about maybe the nuclear example as like what could happen to AI. And there's a lot of people saying like we need to have that sort of a regulatory regime now for AI. So, so give us some examples or thoughts on like the sort of worst case scenario of like if we do go down that route with artificial intelligence or like past examples of how we could do it so wrong. Well, um yeah, you know, you mentioned the nuclear. I wonder, you know, I, I, I certainly, I, listen, I think that sort of the regular uh, regulatory capture model is, is real. And uh, if you already have the models and you're a big company with, you know, with uh, big washing operations, uh, you wouldn't mind seeing, you know, a lot of government intervention here because that's something you can handle. But I do think that there is a legitimate concern uh, among uh, some executives who have like an Oppenheimer complex where they're, you know, they've, they've created this tremendous yeah. thing that, 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 that accomplished something that needed to be accomplished, but oh, but what if it gets out of control? And yeah. so, I, so I do think there's, uh, that's going on. Um, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the nuclear. Uh, let me since, uh, let me think about a different example of nuclear, which is, um, and also I think relates to techno panic. I think about a different kind of techno panic. Uh, what if, um, what if last November, uh, it was not OpenAI launching this this technology? Uh, what if it was Tencent? What if it was Alibaba? What if it was some other a Chinese company none of us have ever heard of, and they had. They had released this amazing new AI that was years ahead of the United States. What would be the reaction on Capitol Hill? Would, would, it, would, it, be, would it be about regulation? Would it be like, we blew it. Why weren't, you know, what were we doing? What, what, the private sector blew it. Uh, where, where was all our R&D? What happened? That's what we'd be talking about, that we have, we have lost this key economic race, a national security race to China. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a powerful argument that I hope is legitimately employed by people mm -hmm. to argue, like what kind of world uh, are we going to be looking at where we have this new technology, you know, caged by all manner of regulation? Do you think that heightens the risk or lowers the risk of less technological progress? Perhaps you know, you know. Perhaps China will stumble their way into a breakthrough. I, I would say that is a risk we absolutely cannot take. So this point about this sort of like a geopolitical yes. str str uh, strategic advantage, and uh, Haley, you mentioned earlier, like the global competitiveness angle to this. I mean, you know, as you pointed out, say what you want about you know where we stand with social media and tech companies, but America's tech companies are household names across the globe, as you pointed out, and your point about like can't name anybody. In and if you th I mean, if you think that was such a telling that like, you know, when you were saying like, you know, we, we got, you know, a, uh, internet regulation wrong and look what's happened. And I thought what you were going to say, well, look what's happened, uh, you know, is going to be different for disinformation. Look what's happened. We have, we have all these big, bad, you know, crown jewel trillion dollar companies. Well, listen, if your view is that one of the big downsides of AI is that all the leading AI companies will be these amazingly profitable companies. And when you look at the most valuable AI companies in 10 years, they'll all be $10 trillion American companies. Well, that's certainly a different well, way of looking and, at the world. And everyone benefits from it too, right? Um, you can disagree with big social media companies. I mean, I used to work at one and I disagreed with a lot of the, the content policy decisions they made in particular. But um, 
every, every American that has a 401k or a pension plan or some other retirement savings vehicle is heavily invested in the top companies in the market. So like, and you have the Facebooks and the Googles really to thank for where your 401k is or your, your defined benefit plan. So um, I don't think everyone materializes it that way, yeah. but I like to kind of make that connection. In my experience, and when I'm up on the hill talking to some offices, it, the only thing that gets them back to a point of sanity is when I say, have you heard of China? You know, this could be a danger for us if we get this wrong. We've been lucky to get it right so far, and America's companies are global leaders. And your point about, like, not being able to name any European companies, I used to challenge my students when I was at university, say, like, name me one, any one, yeah. Euro you know, European digital Spotify. tech. Spotify was yeah. usually it, right? Sometimes they mistakenly say something like PayPal or something, or not PayPal, uh, uh, Skype or something like that. It's like, no, that doesn't work anymore. It's been owned by American companies. So it's like, that's a that's an instructionary, that's a cautionary tale. Like, we got it. Right. It's, not, it's not just like a clever argument to, yeah. win a, to win a debate. Like, that's reality. That's reality, yeah. The, the, you know, the, the war that, that I want the 21st century to be another American century. And if, if, we, if this is as important a technology as we think, and it is dominated by U.S. companies and uh, U.S. technologists, this will be the Ameri This will be the Amer now. Maybe you don't think that's important. So then I guess that's a, that's a whole different market. But I happen to think it is really, really important that that a liberal that that the American that a liberal democratic country is the one at the technological frontier setting the rules. And if in one fell swoop we can say we can we can sort of win the century, man, I'd hate to blow I'd hate to blow that because we're really really worried about a Terminator scenario. Yep. Where there's going to be a little disinformation, and we've always dreamed of having a, a, a regulatory agency that will basically be regulating the entire economy because AI will be in the entire economy. Um, uh, that would really be a and shame. speech and regulating For sure. speech in the press. Too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and it's not just China. Also, um, you know, there are a lot of smart computer people in Russia. Um, Russia is not as front of mind as China is for good reasons, but uh, you know, if they want, and and I don't know, and this Victoria, is Victoria. I'm a I'm a child is, of the '80s. I'm always is, thinking about Russia. Getting, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but I also wonder at what point these tools. I mean, you do need a lot of high-powered hardware, so mm -hmm. that limits it um, in the same way. But you know, you don't even have to necessarily—they don't even have to be nation-state actors potentially. So, I, I yeah. just think you know. It, no, that's a great point. Even, the scarier you think it is, the more you should make sure you're at the frontier. Right. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I agree that a lot of the uh, a lot of the the things that come out of Silicon Valley where they say it's really scary. You know, it's their thing. They think it's really important. They, you know, and they're inspired by this grand, there's a lot of grandiosity in Silicon Valley. It, it does great things, but it also makes people think that they're like this, you know, that what they do is the most important thing in the history of the world ever, to quote <laughs> Oppenheimer. Um, yeah, so. Okay. So this is a very good point, Virginia. And you know, uh, earlier this year, Meta, uh, who runs Facebook, came out with the biggest open source uh, AI model in the world, briefly, for a 60 billion parameter uh, model. It's a big model, open sourced it. Big deal, and just two months later, the the UAE, the government of the UAE, released a 180 billion parameter model that instantly became the largest in the world that the government of the UAE is promoting. Now, I don't, I'm not promoting that idea, like nation state development of giant AI models, but it's happening. And Russia, if you, have, if you have money, yeah. you can do it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and, and so there's a one interesting thing we're tracking on the AI front is actually where the national security establishment is on AI. And interestingly, we're seeing a lot of the voices in the defense space being anti-regulation because they understand how important the defense competitive edge is in the development of this technology. Um, and it's, that's interesting to me because I have generally seen the defense community be more protectionist, um, <laughs> especially with you know, trade and, and saying, oh, we need to like do, have all these materials made domestically, I guess, 
Well, that's kind sort of, of the, the, the that's same kind thing, of the argument. But at it's least in this case, yeah. it's um, yeah. also, you know, fostering the anti-regulatory argument. So yeah. we like yeah. to see that. So we're, we're, we're getting short on time here, but I wanted to ask you, uh, the theme of the day has been very much trust. And like, how do you build trust in institutions, entities, technologies, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that could derail that trust for the world of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies more generally. And in uh, Virginia, in your book, James and yours, you both sort of end with a note about some of these things. James, you say, my concern is that our downwing instincts will push us to be overly cautious and will retreat from developing anything that could theoretically create existential risk. In Virginia, you said uh, almost 25 years ago, in the name of order, the technocrats want to limit building and restrict growth. We're talking about the precautionary principle, as Haley identified earlier, like uh, people who say, I fear the future, I fear risk, and therefore I want to preemptively plan or stop it in its tracks. And basically trying to stop any theoretical bad thing from happening could also end up stopping a lot of the good things from happening. Uh, but this is a real problem for us. So how do we rebuild trust in an age when, I mean, in the, in the, in the schools and the programs that do tech policy, I go and monitor them and they, they're all about degrowth now and about limiting and like restricting um, growth. And when Ted Kaczynski died uh, earlier this year, I was shocked by how on social media there were all these younger kids that were coming out and like, like Uncle Ted, he had some really interesting ideas. I'm like, good Lord, Uncle Ted, you know, this man bombed and killed main people, right? So, uh, I mean, how do we build trust in emerging tech and just more generally in the future and in progress and in dynamism? Well, I think that Jim alluded to it earlier when he talked about people having experience with things. And, and the less experience you have with the positives of whatever form of technological progress you're talking about, the harder it is to trust. And I mean, when I think about AI, you know, when I, I think about problems that I have in my own life. So, for example, you know, it's taking three of us siblings to manage my elderly mother's, like, bureaucratic affairs. <laughs> um, I don't have any kids. Who's going to manage mine? <laughs> Um, you know, whether it's making sure the bills are paid or all these, you know, that's the kind of thing, that personal assistant that everybody has. And that's even without getting into the caregiver issues, which I'm not sure AI can, can solve. But um, so there are lots of things that these technologies can do in ordinary people's ordinary everyday lives that have nothing to do with the Terminator. And I think that people need to see that more. Yeah. I actually think the image generation stuff is really good in that regard. Hmm. James? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think I mentioned that, you know, the ability for people who have a more, you know, pro-progress point of view to actually create images and art and not wait on Hollywood to do it for them. I think that's helpful. I think, and I, and I, and I you know, I'm not an artist, but I can create a pretty, a pretty, what I think is a pretty interesting, you know, image of the future. I think pretty soon I'll be able to create a pretty good uh, uh, movie about the future. Um, I, I think it is, I think it is important that people see results in society. And there's a great study about what undermines liberal democracy. What undermines liberal democracy are liberal democracies that don't deliver the goods, that where where we where they're unable to deliver economic growth. Um, you know, for some people, the 1990s are a long time ago. To me, it really seems not that long ago. But it was a time where you had, you know, the big concern among many, rising inequality. You had rising inequality in the 1990s. But no one much cared because there was tangible benefits to people's lives. The growth was obvious. W wages were rising across the board. A, a, it really was kind of a, you know, all boats were rising scenario. And, you know, people didn't care. They didn't care. The, there wasn't like an Occupy Wall Street movement back in, back in the 1990s. There wasn't talk of late capitalism in the 90s because, <laughs> because we actually had real meaningful economic growth. Uh, so, you know, can you get that in a culture which is so risk averse? Um, I hope I hope that's not true, and that we can that we that these technologies are powerful enough that even with bad governance, we can still have the kind of growth that people can say, "Well, you know, this works. Yep. Wow, this technology is actually working. Let's have more of it." 
Haley, concluding thought, I mean, can we rebuild trust in innovation, the future, technology on Capitol Hill, and in the policy community more generally? <laughs> well, I, I do think uh, the point about people having comfort with the technology is, is really well taken. Um, that will just happen over time. And I think innovators do, in America at least, find ways to break through. I mean, look at Uber, right? That company should have, not should have been doomed, but like, you know, it had a founder that caused a lot of problems, but the, the underlying tech and the need for that, um, the demand for the service, I guess I should say, was so strong that they were able to break through when they took on the New York taxi cab, I don't know, Commission. mafia. Yeah, they did. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better word for it. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, now we have two really great competitors in that space, more more smaller ones. I, it's just, I guess because I'm watching Super Pumped, I'm just thinking about Uber right now. <laughs> but um, innovators will break through, I think, hopefully. But um, Jim, you made a broader point about economic growth and prosperity kind of being an important precondition for people um, being more likely, I guess, to accept new technologies. And tell me if I'm misquoting you. But um, I think there's a real risk, not just with over-regulating AI because there's hype around it and Congress wants to do something, but we also have to kind of back up and think about other ways that we're discouraging innovation and growth and productivity throughout American society because, I mean, there's a reason that we have the most successful companies in the world to date, and a lot of it's because we have a really pro R&D environment. We have very strong intellectual property rights. Um, we now have more competitive corporate taxation, and um, regulation is just another piece of that puzzle, but we, need, we, we can't kind of miss the forest for the trees as well. We need to continue creating the environment for growth and productivity um, beyond just AI. Amen to that. Well, uh, we're going to have to wrap up, folks, but I want you to encourage you to make sure you get the copies of the, these books. Uh, James, I forgot to mention, job really well done in citing me twice in this book. You get an A+. Plus. <laughs> and Virginia, when, Those I are the two highlights of the book. when I finally convinced Virginia to do the, the follow-up to this, you know, you're going to have to cite me twice, me. three times, in fact. Don't convince me. Convince Simon & Schuster. They said no. Well, <laughs> our street will publish that book. <laughs> well, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today for an excellent conversation.